Greetings, friends. Welcome once again to our regular Wednesday night Bible class. These classes are coming to you through the facilities of the Midwest Center for Truth here in northwest Arkansas, just out the, just outside the little town of Leslie, Arkansas, here in the Ozark Mountains. And these classes are being brought to you uh, as a ministry of CMI Bible Research Center, which is located here on campus. And through they are a production of CMI Audio Video Network Systems, being brought to you through the internet by Ustream and YouTube. So we welcome you with us tonight. We are involved in this particular Wednesday night class with the Feasts of the Lord. And currently we're looking at... Uh, the Feast of Pentecost. Now, we are bringing, as the Lord enables us to do so, we are bringing the reality of these feasts right over into Christ. And that's what we've been doing with the Feast of Pentecost as well. Uh, in Leviticus 23, let's just read there again. We, read, we do that very often. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Leviticus 23. Uh, and if I don't give you verses, that means we start at verse 1. Leviticus 23, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my Feast. And there's no reason to read any farther than that because the emphasis is these feasts were initiated by God himself as the feasts of the Lord. And they were holy times of gathering, holy convocations, even Sabbaths unto the Lord. And these came to be fulfilled in Christ. We have dealt with, uh, at least in, a, in an overview way and, 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 and dealt with in some fashion, the Feast of Passover. And now we've moved on to the Feast of Pentecost. We're looking at that feast being fully come. Acts we read in the second chapter when the day of Pentecost was fully come. There's no other place in the Bible that will, you will read that. Uh, though that feast had been going on for hundreds if not thousands of years uh, as a feast of the Lord year by year by year by year was never referred to as fully come. And yet here the scripture testifies that on that particular day, the, the day of Pentecost was fully come. The fullness of that day, of course, is Christ himself, because that is the day and that is the fulfillment in which Christ, by his spirit and as his spirit, Christ as his spirit, indwelt the believers that were gathered together in obedience to his word before his ascension, just 10 days prior to his coming in another form, a new form, coming in spirit to indwell what is known as his body, to indwell those believers as his very own body. Hun there is but one body of Christ. There is but one church. Folks speak about the early church and, and always have. Some call it the primitive church. 
And many have done that too. That, that's not my point. And then some have called it later on the Reform Church. And, and we keep on with names, but the point is there's just one church and it started when the day of Pentecost was fully come. The author of it, the finisher of it, the beginning and the end of it is Christ himself. We are not a different church than Paul ministered to in his, in personally and in his epistles. We're not a different church than the epistles in the New Testament and the Gospels were written to and the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ written to that church. We're not a different church. This is a, 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 a different year, different earthen vessels involved, Certainly there has come many systems forth calling itself the church, but I'm not talking about the systems of religion. Going all the way back to the first one, the Catholic Church. Then after that there were uh, different groups calling themselves the church, though many of them didn't have the word church in their title. That's all right. They call themselves the church. Uh, it seems that as that continued, one group would say, well, we are the church and we don't know what you are. And, well, that may or may not have been so. My point is there's been many organizations, whether you want to call it an organization or not. It was an organization. Many groups, denominations, whether you want to call it a denomination or not, that's what it was. Uh... That, 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 that came up. Uh, most of them in some kind of rebellion from the Catholic Church uh, or a reformation of it or a branch off of it. Religion, Christian religion. Meanwhile, all of that time, there's still just one body of Christ. Just one body church and we are baptized by this spirit of Pentecost this spirit of Christ we are baptized by that spirit John relates that spirit directly to Jesus Christ our Lord he shall baptize you And if we're part of that body, it is because we are baptized into Christ by the Spirit of God. And then many things relating to that truth, to that church, are true. But there's nothing that is related to that church which is true that does not have to be revealed in the person, in the face of Jesus Christ as the truth. It becomes truth in our heart through the revealing of the Son. And all of this begins, effectively begins as far as an indwelling, as a coming again. It begins with Pentecost. We know that the feast begins with Passover. Passover is the realization of the death, the burial, the resurrection. You see, unless we are baptized into Christ, and Paul says it, do you not understand when we're baptized into Jesus Christ, you were baptized into his death, that you were buried with him by baptism into his death, 
so that like as Christ was raised up by the glory of the Father, even we should walk in newness of life. How do we walk in newness of life? As Christ was raised up, we walk in newness of life because Christ is the resurrection and the life who lives in us. We don't just decide to become Christians. We walk in newness of life through the reality, through the indwelling Christ, and through that reality being revealed consistently by the Father himself. The church, the church, to be quickened together, one body raised, one body seated as one body, to walk in the light as he is in the light. This begins with Pentecost. So that's what we're talking about. And we're, we're talking about the, the indwelling, the abode of God. The abode of God. And that's, that's what we were talking about when I stopped. And here is, in this reality of the high thought of God that we were talking about, the high thought of God that is set forth in the fullness of what Pentecost really is, Christ in you, is bound up with God's desire to dwell in his house, whose house we are. And he does that in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reality of that only comes by the revealing of the Son in you. Now, what I'm saying to you I could just as easily read it out of the scripture. I could just as easily read it out of the epistles of Paul. So what I'm saying to you is true. But what I'm wanting us to hear is it must become the truth in my soul and it can only become the truth. My union with Christ only becomes the truth. My baptism into Christ only becomes the truth. My baptism into his death, burial, only becomes the truth. Newness of life only becomes the truth. When the truth is revealed in my soul. That's when it is the truth. Jesus saying, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It is that it is because Christ came and indwelled the church. It is because Christ lives in me and in every born again one. Therefore, let's bring that together. It is because he lives in his body that he must be revealed in his body. Because what we actually lay hold of in our soul what we actually lay hold of, become possessors of, we lay hold of in the faith of the Son of God. How does such faith come? It comes through the Father revealing His Son 
Who is that Son? He is the eternal Word, the eternal thought, the eternal intention. He is the eternal Word of God. How cometh, by what cometh, the faith of the Son of God. It comes through the revealing of the Son of God. And I'm speaking now not of a faith whereby I acknowledge that there is a God or a faith whereby I acknowledge, acknowledge that, that there is a Christ. I'm not now speaking of my faith in Him. I am speaking of His faith working in me. That is the faith by which it is said the just shall live. The just shall live. This is the faith that Paul speaks of when he says the life that I now live in the flesh, which he means when I get up in the morning. The life that I live every day, that I live in this earthen vessel, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It is by that faith that he understands Christ as his righteousness, saying, Oh, that I may be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is by the law, which at one time was the righteousness that he held on to dearly un, un, until the Lord brought him to a crisis in that matter. And he understood, and he understood that his faith in the law brought him to absolute frustration because in the law he could not be the righteousness that the law even demanded. But that faith does come to those in whom Christ is revealed. We come, as it were, from an outward faith to an inward faith. We come from faith to faith. The faith of the Old Testament, faith in God, all of that, but based on outward observances and outward appearances, based on promises that were real and true but not yet fulfilled, to the faith that declares not the outward observances but is a result of the inward appearing, to a faith that declares not that the promises are coming, but shows those promises, every one of them, fulfilled in Christ. We come to the faith of the Son of God. The reality that we receive and walk in by faith came with Pentecost with Pentecost. I think back on this, so I want to turn to the manual now and continue these lessons. The manual that I'm speaking of is the manual of Pentecost. Uh, the title of it is Pentecost, Hoax or Reality. We're declaring the reality of it. It is a manual that we wrote here and publish here. It is a manual that is available to you. I look back and I see the highest thought, the ultimate desire of God, beginning with 120 souls, hidden as it were. Now I'm, re, I'm going over this just for a point. Hidden as it were. Even if they were in a room that was in the temple. And it's very likely that they were. They were still hidden. It was as if. It was behind the veil. 
of the whole old covenant. Because the old covenant Israel was all around them celebrating their feast of Pentecost at the same time God was celebrating his feast of Pentecost. And the veil was still upon their hearts. There's no doubt about that. But it was like it was still all being done behind the veil. And to those that were not there waiting in obedience, having one mind, one accord, as the instructions, yes, the command of the Lord was given to be, there was a veil. They heard it and did not understand. They saw it taking place and yet did not understand. The people said they're all drunk. And Peter stood up and quoted from Joel. How many do you think how many do you think received what he said? We read that 5,000 were convicted and that they were added to the Lord that day. I was thinking about that. They were almost in complete obscurity. The greatest miracle that had ever taken place on the face of the earth, the greatest miracle that had ever involved men took place. The Almighty God indwelled humanity in that way. The Spirit of God. It had never been so. Never had it been so. And then I, I thought about the incarnation when Christ was born under the law, born of the woman. Because the Incarnation was actually God becoming man for the purpose of death. But Pentecost is no such thing. Pentecost was not God becoming man, nor is man becoming God. But it is Christ coming in fullness of spirit, fullness of power to dwell in those that are his. It is the birth of a new creation in Christ, the center of which is not man. Well, you say, well, oh, well, brother, we know it's not Adam. It's not you either. It's not me either. It's not man. It isn't man. I know if any man be in Christ... He is a new creation, but the center of that new creation is Christ himself. The man of that new creation is Christ himself. Look how obscure that incarnation of Christ born of the flesh look how obscure that was even in its natural setting and yet look at the consequences of it the consequences of Christ becoming man ultimately was the crucifixion of the whole Adamic creation ultimately was the fulfillment of every promise given of God, every prophecy spoken by a prophet of God. And look how obscure that birth was.
And the whole point of that death was to bring that, that birth, that coming, that indwelling of man. And becoming man was to bring man to his end. That a new kind can come forth in spirit. A new creation. And that is what happened on this day of which we are speaking. On this feast which is fulfilled in Christ. That's the reason Christ himself, honey, spent 40 days with his disciples. He kept them there, nurtured them, spent time with them, but they still had to see him with natural eyes to believe before Pentecost could come. That form of him had to be taken away from them. And it was. It was. And he instructed them to, to not go out and begin to preach his words. It, we, we've looked at this before, but I was looking at it this afternoon. He instructed them. He he required of them. He, he made a point. You go wait until you receive power from on high. You go wait until. Wait until. But he didn't tell them now, I'm about to be taken out from your midst. Here's what you do. Right now, immediately, you go out and preach my words. Do not go out and begin to tell what I've said to you. No, it's not time for you to do anything yet. You do absolutely nothing until you are endued with power from on high. We read that and mistakenly think that he said he would give you the power to go out and do things. They couldn't go out and do things until... No, but that's not what the power was all about. That isn't what the power was all about. In fact, when things happened as a result of them going out, they denied that they did any of those things. I didn't heal you. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. It is, it is the one that you crucified whom God has raised up who dwells in us. It is in his name, his person, the reality of him that all of this that you see being done is done. No, the power they received at Pentecost was the same power that John talks about. That he would baptize them, the Holy Spirit, with fire. And those that would receive him would receive power. It's power to become the sons of God. A whole new creation was about to come forth in the power of his resurrection. Everything that he had told them recorded in John 14 was about to begin to take place. What about John 14 and 15 and 16 and 17? Let's look at it. John 14, 1 through 3. Here's something that was about to take place. And with the coming of Pentecost did take place. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Some read that my Father's house is a great, large place of dwelling. If it were not so, and I, and I believe that to be the best translation. Why do I believe that to be the best translation? It goes back to the first 
feast of the Lord that they were instructed to do in Egypt in the land of Goshen. When they were instructed of the Lord. This was the beginning of time for them. The beginning of time. No longer would they measure time by the, the calendar of other of the world, of other countries or powers of the world. No, it was the beginning of time for them. Just as it is when we come to the reality of that in Christ Jesus. But what happened? They took a lamb, a lamb for a house. Now, and it meant a household, a lamb for a household, but it actually come down to a dwelling place where that, the actual house where the household dwelt. They took a lamb. And, and, and how was the size of that household determined? It was determined by how many it took to eat that lamb. Now, fast forward back to where we were. Fast forward back to what was fulfilled with the coming of Christ into his body at Pentecost. In my father's house, or many mansions, I believe the translation that emphasizes that, it, that the house is a large dwelling place is correct. Why? Because it because it is measured by the greatness of the Lamb of God himself. How many does it take to eat that lamb? Ho, 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 ho. They can't even be numbered. They can't even be numbered. It is a great house. A great abode. Because of the Lamb. The Lamb. Through whose death we enter there whose flesh and blood we eat there, whose life we live there. The Lamb, the great Lamb. See, that's why I believe that that translation is the best. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again, receive you unto myself. Christ himself is the place. The place is the person. I will come again. I will come anew. I will come in newness and receive you into myself that where I am there well strike there it's not in it's not in the, the, the best text that where I am ye may be also verse 6 John 4 I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. John 14, 16, and 20. I will pray the Father. He will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And he came as that comforter. He came in spirit as the spirit. And yet a little while the world seeth me no more, but you 
see me? Because I live, ye shall live also. And that's the correct order, friends. Because I live. Because I live. Many try to explain Galatians 2 from the standpoint of a natural mind or more specifically from the standpoint of man, from the standpoint of me, even from the standpoint of me as a believer, still from the standpoint of me. Well, Jesus has said it here. The same thing Paul says there, I'm crucified with Christ. Yet I live. Now, now, because I live, you shall live also. It's the same thing Paul says. Give the man time to write it. Give him time to say it. I live, yet I live. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. Because I live, ye shall live also. It doesn't mean T-double-O, but rather by me. Christ liveth in me. He is the life of my soul. You understand that? He's not merely soul life. And he's certainly not soulish life, self-life. It's wrong to even call that life because it is not life. It is a figment of the lie, a figment of imagination of men's own heart. Christ is the life, the only life, and he's the only he's the only one who liveth in me but see there's the point because he liveth i have life because he liveth i live also not two t double o no not two i live yet not i Christ liveth in me, but he is the life of my soul. You understand that, huh? He's the life of my soul. I don't know any other way to say it. I mean, I'll run out of, I'll run out of words. I would run out of Greek or Hebrew words if I was fluent in those languages. I'm scarcely fluent in the English language, and I'll run out of words. I'm trying to tell you it isn't that me, that me, as a soul, do not live, I do. But I live only because Christ liveth in me. That's the life. He living in my soul is the life of my soul. My soul is not Christ, and Christ is not my soul, and my soul doesn't disappear. What happens to it? It's made pleat by spirit. Finally, Finally, I have spirit. Not human spirit. My soul has spirit. The spirit of Christ. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What was not complete is now complete. What was not complete is now complete. And the completeness of it is Christ himself. I find my completeness in him. Without him, I am not complete. In fact, without him, I'm dead in sin. Separated from God. A soul meant to have completeness which does not have it. But with Christ coming and indwelling, I have completeness. Why? 
because in him all completeness dwells. Fullness of the Godhead bodily. All fullness. All treasures. All riches of treasures. All riches of blessings. All fullness. And in him, I, my soul, but you see, we say my soul as if there's a difference between me and my soul, and there isn't. I find my completeness in him. I'm not finding me in him. I'm finding my completeness in him. I'm not finding me living again in him. I'm finding him living again in me. Now how many other ways can we say this? But this is what came with the day of Pentecost and cannot be understood by in any way except that one, that indwelling Christ, that Son of God, be revealed by the Father. And in so doing, opening the eyes of my understanding, because the eyes of my understanding are not opened, enlightening the eyes of your understanding. Enlightening with what? The light of the glory of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light which Christ is. The only way the eyes of my soul are enlightened is through the light of his appearing. Until Christ is revealed in me, I do not know him except in the flesh. And by fleshly understanding and by natural reasoning. Now, I can certainly, I can certainly know him in that way, but not as the indwelling life. Not in a way that will transform my soul. I can I can embrace him as being everything that he is. I can embrace that he is in me. I can believe that. All in the natural mind. I will get great uh, pleasure out of that if I, you know, if I love the Lord, if I am born again. And Christ is in me. I can try to relate to him with my natural mind by believing and embracing spiritual things, things that I that I actually come to understand. You can come to understand them not with the understanding given of God, but with the understanding of the natural mind. And I I can be elated by that. I can. I mean I can be elated by, by, by the Scripture and by coming to a new view of the Scripture. I really can't. You think it can't happen, but it can, hon. It can. And it, and it does. But one thing that never happens... With the natural mind, I never see the truth. I never see the truth of Pentecost. I never see the person of Pentecost. I never see him. And therefore my soul never faces judgment nor does it face grace? Judgment and grace are teachings 
otherwise. Judgment and grace are teachings. They're, they're, they're theologies. They will find application one way or another. But in fact, judgment must be revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Grace must be revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of life only shines in the face of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's talking about here. Even the spirit of truth, verse 17, whom the world receiveth not. But you know him, he dwelleth with you, speaking of himself, shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. But you shall see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day, you shall know, I am in my Father. You are in me, and I in you. That reality comes that reality comes with Pentecost. And the spirit of truth, which Christ himself is, the truth comes with Pentecost, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. A great journey begins with Pentecost. A great journey. A great walk begins with Pentecost. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If you love me, you will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come into him and make our abode with him. John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Hun, that all comes with Pentecost. Now it's a life we receive and an ongoing and, and, and the spirit of truth that we receive. What I'm telling you is that that all comes with Pentecost. Whether the believer will walk in that or not. I was raised in what we call Pentecost and with me it wasn't, I thought it, the whole fullness of it was speaking in tongues. I found that, not, that that is not the fullness of it at all. That the fullness is Christ himself. But the fullness still came with Pentecost. Hun, whether Christ is revealed in you or not, he's in you if you are born from above. If he indwells you, then he is in you. Whether you know it or not. But the purpose of him being in you is that he may be formed in you, that you may be filled with his knowledge of himself. Oh yes, he speaks of the spirit of which he is the spirit. He sends the spirit which he is. You understand that in that mystery of God? That mystery of God. 
the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in him and he dwelleth in you. That Christ may be revealed in you. See, there, there is the answer to the one who would know Christ. To the one who would know his salvation. To the one who would know the miracle of Pentecost. Is that you might experience inwardly the full working of Pentecost. Paul says, according to his working which worketh in me mightily. Because Hun that is an ever ongoing working. Let's look at this. We have time for me to read it. John 17, I'm skipping down. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes, verse 1, to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Pentecost is the witness that this is true that this happened and is true. Hallelujah to the Lamb of the living God. Verse 9, I pray for them who that you gave me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they, they, are, my, they are thine, and all mine are thine and thine are mine. Hallelujah. He goes on to say, even as, even as you are in me and I am in you, so let that reality be in them that I am in them. All mine are thine, thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Verse 15, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Hunt, if your soul is ever going to be sanctified, it has to be in the revelation of the truth, himself, Jesus Christ. There you will find the sanctification of your soul. You'll not find it in the doing or the not doing of anything outside of seeing him. Now that's a fact. It is a reality. It is the truth that the Father would reveal in our very soul. I'm not talking about the results of sanctification here. There are results. There's no doubt about it. There are results but it seems like to me we get the cart before the horse. We try to make the results the way to be sanctified. But no, sanctification of our soul is 
by the truth. You shall know the truth, and if the Son hath made you free, you shall be free. And come on, hon. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Verse 23, 26. I in them, thou in me. See here, to the natural mind it gets more confusing. Of course, we unconfuse the natural mind by simply making doctrines out of all of this stuff. And then no one agrees with anybody else's doctrine. Or we make theological viewpoints and then nobody agrees with everyone else's theological viewpoint. It's none of that. It is the reality revealed in the indwelling Christ. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And he's the one. And that the world, the Jewish world of the day, the age of the day, and we could say the age of any day, may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me, but particularly as it was saying there, primarily as it was spoken there at that time by the Lord in his prayer, it was the Jewish world and the Jewish age. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. This is exactly what he told his disciples. That they, but here it is, that they may behold my glory. See, hon, that they... We've got this idea that we behold ourselves. No, you don't. If you do, you haven't waited long enough in God's mirror. No, no. Behold my glory. When he who is our life shall appear. Then. Then we shall appear with him in glory. But that's still not the appearing of you and I. It is beholding him in his glory. And understanding he is in us. Where I am. There he is. Where he is. There I am. Why? Because he brings it all into my soul. And there he is revealed. And there I see my life. Not the life of me, my life. Yes, the life of my soul. Yes, my life. And there I see my glory, which is not me at all, but rather it is Him glorified in me that they I, in whom I am glorified, those in whom I am glorified, that they may see my glory. For no flesh shall glory in His presence. Hun, none of this is made real by the theologies of it, the proper teachings of it. It is not made real in you by what I'm saying. And that's why in the presenting of this reality, I fill it up with, it is not through hearing me, but hearing him. What I tell you is true, but the truth of it is a person. That which transforms your soul, a person. Honey's in you. I'm not describing somebody that's just in me. He's in you. But he must be revealed in you as much as he is revealed, the same as he is revealed in me. He must live in you just as he lives in me. He must live in me just as he lives in another brother. Or He must live in you, therefore he must be revealed in you.
they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. That's what he's doing now, hon. And that's what he began to do in them at Pentecost. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. And I in them. Pentecost was the answer to this prayer. That is the reason Pentecost is not a one-time experience or a one-day event. No, no. It is the event of the day which Christ is as he is the light of that day as well. May you and I begin to experience the reality of Pentecost in our souls. Hallelujah. It's good to be with you. Glad to have you with us in this particular medium. I would like to invite you who have a heart to know Christ, a desire to see Him, to hear Him, that He be revealed in you. I would encourage you to come to the gathering that is taking place here on June the 22nd through the 26th. We are not gathering here to theologies or teachings, mine, yours, or anybody else's. We're gathering here for the sole purpose of seeing Jesus. To hear his voice, to see his face, we shall gather here and open our hearts one with another to the very Spirit of God that would work in us unto the knowing of Christ. I ask you to come and be with us. Come and be with us. Monday through Friday, starting Monday night, ending Friday noon. Meals are served. That for the outward man. The gathering is for the inward man, and the gathering is unto the new man himself, Christ. Come and join with us. If you need more information, email us, call us. We'll be glad to help you with arrangements. But come and join with us for this gathering. And may the Lord richly bless you. If there's any way we can be of help to you, let us know. Any way we can minister to you beyond what we are doing now or to enlarge what we are doing now, please let us know. Have a very, very good evening. Amen.